You heard a little bit of a, you heard a little bit of a riff in that organ prelude. And you know why. Some of you recognize that riff. She began just by putting her hands on her hips, kind of swaying back and forth to a guitar riff. I think I'm going to begin every sermon the way Tina Turner began her sermon. <laughs> she would say, you know, every now and again, we think you might like to hear something nice, <laughs> something nice and easy. And then she'd throw back her head and laugh. She said, there's just one thing. We never, ever, ever do anything nice and easy. And then she sang, left a good job in the city. You know this one, right? Working for the man every night and day. But I never lost one moment of sleep thinking about the way things might have been. Here's the chorus. Big wheel, keep on turning. Proud Mary, keep on burning. Hey, and we're rolling, rolling, rolling on the river. That's all I got, Katie. <laughs> yeah. Nice and easy. On the Rosales, it's, it's nice and rough. It's the way Tina wanted it. Because nice and easy was not Tina Turner. When she and Ike put their stamp on that Creedence Clearwater Revival hit from 1969, Proud Mary, Ike was not a fan, incidentally. Ike didn't want to record it. Tina was the one who talked him into doing it. And once she got out of that abusive marriage and rebuilt her solo career from the ground up, Tina Turner made Proud Mary her song. She, she was Proud Mary. She was the one who took a classic rock standard about being discharged from the National Guard and finding yourself on a riverboat and turned it into an anthem about what it means to start your life over from nothing. It's about rolling down the river, right? The river is central to that song. And rivers have always been about freedom, certainly in American mythology, right? We know this from the adventures of Huck Finn, Tom and Huck making their way down the Mississippi River, Eliza in Uncle Tom's cabin crossing the frozen Ohio River from slavery into freedom, Woody Guthrie's, in our part, part of the world, Woody, Woody Guthrie's hymn to the Bonneville Power Administration, roll on, Columbia, roll on. We know rivers. In the Pacific Northwest, we know rivers. That's an image with biblical resonance. Four rivers in Genesis flow out of the Garden of Eden. The people of Israel cross over the Red Sea, and Ezekiel's vision of the restored temple is a vision of, of, of water, living water, rivers of living water flowing down the steps of the temple. We might imagine it flowing down from that organ, down the aisle of the cathedral, down the front steps of the cathedral into Portland. That vision of living water flowing out of the temple, that verse is one possibility for the passage in Hebrew scripture that Jesus has in mind when he says, as scripture, as scripture says, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Nobody knows for sure what scripture he's referencing because between you and me and the bedpost, Hebrew scripture never talks about that. That's actually a verse that we're, we're a little unsure about. He, Hebrew scripture talks a lot about living water, right? Living water flows out of gardens. It flows out of temples. It flows from the throne of God. But in Hebrew scripture, living water never comes out of anybody's heart. Jesus seems to have made that part up. Or he's quoting scripture that we don't have in the Bible anymore. That's one possibility. I suspect, though, that what Jesus is doing is a little bit like what Tina Turner is doing when she preaches. He's, he's riffing. He's using scripture imaginatively, if you like, not literally. Quoting from memory, uh, reinterpreting the texts that were taught to him as a, as a kid. And there's lots of places in Hebrew scripture where God's presence, God's holy presence, the living power of God in the world is described or imagined as a river flowing like great water, God's power rolling like a river. So crossing over that river, right, that has always signified freedom. Whether that's the, the people of Israel crossing the Red Sea, enslaved Africans crossing the Ohio, which they named the Jordan River. They took it from, from, from the Bible in the spirituals so that their enslavers wouldn't know that they weren't really singing about the Bible, right? They were singing about freedom. They were giving directions to each other about how to get over that river into freedom, how to get out. That's the living water, I think, that Jesus is talking about, the power of life. Right? The power of, of self-determination, the ability to make choices. It's the, it's the freedom to make choices about your body, 
about your own emotional and spiritual life, how you choose to believe, how, you, how you're going to spend your time, whom you're allowed to love, how you choose to form a family. It's the freedom to, to decide your own name, right? The one freedom that Tina Turner demanded in her divorce settlement. She was born Anna Marie Bullock in Nutbush, Tennessee. But when she finally escaped from the abuses of Ike Turner, the only thing she took with her, other than 36 cents and a mobile credit card in her pocket, was the name that he, that he created for her, the name that he enforced upon her without ever asking her permission. It was Buddhism, actually, that saved her. I think Buddhism was Tina Turner's Pentecost. I think that's the moment where she started chanting these prayers and mantras in a language that I imagine was pretty foreign for a good Baptist girl from Tennessee who grew up singing in the church choir. Years later, she would say, the best way to change your life is to begin every morning singing like the birds. And that's what she did. She started chanting. She started meditating. She discovered that place inside of her where the water of life, the living water of God, was still bubbling, the voice that taught her that she was worth something better than this abusive relationship that had her caught. Ike owned everything. He owned her name. And she let him keep just about everything, the houses, the cars, the recording studios, all the money they had made together, so long as he would give her the one thing she wanted to take out of that marriage, which was that name, Tina Turner. On the strength of that name, she built her incredible comeback. And Proud Mary, that song that she and Ike had made a billboard hit, that became Tina's song, not Ike's song. That's her song. That's her song of survival. When she sang, I never, I never missed a moment of sleep, thinking about the way things might have been, right? We knew that she knew what she was talking about, which is that life is not about looking back. Life is about moving. Life is about rolling. Tina Turner was rolling. And she's still rolling. That river that she sang about, the river that her enslaved ancestors knew as the Ohio or the Mississippi or the, the mythical Jordan, muddy and cold, that chills the body but not the soul. That river looks an awful lot like death when you find yourself standing on its banks. That's the, that's the water of death, right? That's how the Christian tradition talks about baptism. We say baptism is actually not something that happens to you. It's something that you survive. When you're preparing to make a change in your life, like Tina Turner was making when she fled that hotel room. You don't look back, right? You plunge right in because what awaits you on the other side of that river, whatever it is, has got to be better than the stuff you are leaving behind you. That's baptism, right? That was Tina's baptism anyway, a baptism by fire, if you like, a survivor's baptism, the determination to find something better than the life she knew. She refused to be a victim. She found her voice. And then she started singing. And some of us know a little bit about that story, don't we? Whether we know what it feels like to leave an abusive relationship or an abusive community, whether we know what it feels like to lose everything and start over from scratch, or to, to wade through the river of death itself and come out on the other side. That, pa that passage happens ritually, right? Sunday by Sunday at this font, sometimes with babies, sometimes with adults. But like any ritual, what we're doing in church is not just about the words and the rites and the symbolism of the font and the water and the shell. What this whole thing is really about is the way that those symbols help us to name and, and, deter and, and wrestle with the stuff that we are experiencing in our lives out there in the world. We know what a baptism feels like, right? We know what a baptism looks like. It is not always something that we choose. Often it's something that we survive. It feels like plunging into unknown waters and discovering to your surprise that you actually do know how to swim. It looks like the, like the tenacity of a survivor, rebuilding her life from the ground up, not losing too much sleep, thinking about the way things might have been. Baptism, right? The real, the real kind of baptism, the kind of baptism that life hands us, that kind of baptism changes you forever. In the Christian tradition, we say, that's when you discover that you belong to no human being, no human system, no human-made force or institution or relationship can own or control you. In baptism, you find your true belonging, which is to God, 
right? What we say is, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism. You are marked as Christ's own forever. You do not belong to any human being. So once you've swum in that river, you learn how to recognize the voice of your soul when she comes calling. And if you are very lucky, the sound of your soul sounds a little bit like the voice of Tina Turner. <laughs> sounds like Proud Mary, right? There's a third verse to that song. She sings, if you come down to the river, I bet you're going to find some people who live. And you don't have to worry if you've got no money. People on that river are happy to give. Because there's this, there's this whole community of us who are camped out on the other side of that river, right? We're like, we're like the river rats, you know, this weird motley crew of the twice-born, the saved, the ones who have swum through that river and have made a life for ourselves on its shores, right? As, as the song says, people on the river are happy to give when they recognize one of their kin swimming across towards freedom. Our job, then, is to look out for people like that, to look out for Tina Turner, to look out for people who are swimming, trying to stay afloat in that river, and, and to reach out a hand, right? Reach out a hand to help them. In church, we call that the baptismal covenant. Those are the promises that we renew. We'll, we'll do it here in just a minute. Five simple promises that comprise our commitment to being the river people, right? The ones who are happy to give. We, we ask, will you continue in the apostles' teaching? Will you resist evil every time you come upon it? Will you proclaim the good news? Will you seek and serve Christ in everybody? And will you respect the dignity of every human being? That's our contract, right? That's our, that's our agreement. That's our covenant with the one who made us. We call it the baptismal covenant. And it's the way that, that we who are called identify and claim our own bap baptisms, not just the church baptisms, which we may or may not remember, but the baptisms that life has handed us, right? It's the way that we discover and name the meaning that lies in our pain and our grief. This whole tradition is about helping us to navigate those promises, right, and the path that they set us on. That's living water, right? The, the streams, the living streams that flow, as Jesus says, from the believer's heart and connect us to the source of all the water, the source of all the beauty, all the pain, all the hope. That source is God. That's what baptism means. You step into the river, into the font, into the river of death. The river of death is the river of freedom, and you commit yourself to living in the world as a changed person, as a free person. You commit yourself then to learning how to swim in that water, how to navigate life's weirder moments, because the people around you are drowning. And in this river, we are responsible for one another. So you become one of the saints, right? You become one of the river people. And you commit yourself to following proud Mary when she comes calling your name. It's the big wheel that keeps on turning, right? Maybe that wheel is life. Maybe that's the wheel of suffering in Buddhism. That's the wheel of Dharma. That's the wheel of enlightenment. That big wheel is going to keep on turning. But in the song, it's proud Mary who keeps on burning. She is a light. She's that candle right there. And in a minute, we're going to grab some of those other candles, light them from the big candle. We're going to hand them to these newest initiatives in the river people. And we're going to say, receive this candle as a sign that you have passed from darkness into light and shine as Christ's light in the world to the glory of God our Creator. That's a commissioning, right? That's an invitation to devote your life to proud Mary and everything she represents. To, he to hear the voice of proud Mary when she comes calling your name, who keeps on burning. She just keeps on rolling, right? Rolling and rolling on that great and mighty river of God.